Welcome back. Welcome back. On Thursday, U.S. President George W. Bush endorsed the call from his top commander in Iraq for an indefinite halt to American troop withdrawals and reductions. In his testimony to Congress on Wednesday, General David Petraeus described the recent security gains in Iraq as fragile and reversible and recommended a pause in any withdrawals. My guests today have intimate knowledge of both sides of the war in Iraq. General Sir Mike Jackson served as head of the British Army during the first three years of the Iraq War. And he's going to be talking about the recent developments from a military perspective. After that, we'll be joined by Steve Connors and Molly Bingham, who spent 10 months in Baghdad talking to Iraqi insurgents and hearing their side of the story. But first of all, General Sir Mike. Mike, great to see you. And best-selling author. Oh. <laughs> Congratulations on that. 100,000 copies of Soldier uh, has been running off the shelves, running off the shelves. This is a topical week to be talking about Iraq, you and I here, because we have the situation of uh, President Bush's decision yesterday to put a freeze on troop withdrawals, as we mentioned there. Is that a good decision or is that a worrying decision? I think it's one that flows from what General D David Petraeus had to say to, um, to the House committees. Um, he was very clear, uh, I think, in his language, very guarded, that, yes, there was tactical success, but as he said, it could be seen as fragile and perhaps reversible. So uh, the objectives are not yet secure, I think one could say. And it seems to me that given that evidence from the commander on the ground, that the president's decision was one of logical sequence. And would you characterize the surge so far as a big success, a marginal success? No, I think what? it's significant. significant. I think it's significant and, and without doubt. I mean, statistics, etc. we all know the story about statistics, but you have to have some sort of benchmark. And, and certainly, I think over the, the, the months of the, of the surge, we'll put that in inverted commas, um, incidents, attacks, deaths are demonstrably reduced. So success in that sense, it is significant. But I, I say, David Petraeus' words are in my, in my head. It, it, it could be reversible and it's fragile. So he's being cautious. He's being cautious. Uh, President Bush went further by saying, today we have the initiative. That's a big claim, isn't it? That is a big claim. Um, but I think certainly in Baghdad and central Iraq, that may be a fair claim. Um, one is worried about developments elsewhere, perhaps particularly in the south at the moment. But I, I, I don't see that as hyperbole. Um, Baghdad is a I think um, an improved city and it's en brille. And what do you feel, you've often talked about the treatment of, of soldiers in times of war and so on. George Bush announced he was cutting tours of duty in Iraq and Afghanistan from 15 to 12 months and that service personnel would have, have a year at home for every year they'd, they'd served overseas. And that was applying not just to Iraq but also to Afghanistan. Um, is that the right way to treat your soldiers and should we learn any lesson from that? Well, I've always been a great admirer of, of the US Army for its ability to deploy at the tempo they do. Fifteen months in an operational theatre and, and one with the tempo of Iraq, it's quite a long haul. It is quite a long haul. And the British Army does not attempt to do that sort of tooling. We're on six months. Um, with a longer break in between. And so I say I take my hat off to the American Army's staying power uh, to produce a reduction from 15 to 12 months seems to be modest. Um, I'm sure it'll be appreciated by the soldiers. Um, and um, I'm not sure the British Army would, would be very interested in one-year tours. Yeah. What, about, what about the situation now? I mean, where do we go from here? You were talking about staying power. How long will troops no. from America, anyway, be staying in Iraq? I, David, that's an impossible question yeah. to answer. Um, but I'll do my best to give you a handrail or two here. Um, 
Iraq is still not politically settled. What is going on, in my judgment, is a struggle for power in the post-Saddam Hussein Iraq, as between this and that faction. Uh, it's a struggle for power which, very sadly, far too often is being pursued through violence rather than through democratic means. Uh, now, if that is a political problem, which I believe it to be, the end game must be a political settlement. This is not something that soldiers or policemen or both can, can do on their own, far from it. The root causes seem to me to be political. There therefore must be a political outcome. And it's the job of security forces to avoid the use of violence from determining that outcome. And in fact, whereas on the one hand we were talking about keeping the troops there and so on, there are those who say that in fact if all the troops were withdrawn there'd be less violence. Is that true or is that nonsense? We can't know that. We cannot know that. Uh, what I am clear about is that the coalition remains in Iraq at the behest of the elected Iraqi government. Were they to come to that conclusion that would be a different matter I think. But certainly I have no evidence that the Iraqi government uh, are at the position where they, where they wish to see the coalition gone. I don't think they feel that the situation is yet secure enough or that their own indigenous Iraqi security forces, much effort has gone into training them and equipping them, are, are yet at that level of capability where they can take it all on. And would you say the situation in Afghanistan is more problematical or less problematical than Iraq? It's more complex, I think. Um, and Iraq, uh, for all its, its current troubles, um, let us not forget this is a large country with a relatively large population um, sitting on quite remarkable natural resources. They have the two great rivers, they have their oil and their gas. Um, the potential for Iraq, I think, it could be fantastic once we can get through this, this very difficult period. Afghanistan, also a large country, a relatively small population, but without Iraq's resources and without Iraq's infrastructure and with difficult relations with some of its neighbors. Uh, so I see it as, as a rather different situation. General Sir Mike, thank you very much for being with us and gazing into your crystal ball for us. In a minute, I'll be joined by Steve Connors and Molly Bingham, makers of the award-winning documentary film Meeting Resistance, to talk about the people fighting against the US-led coalition forces and who exactly these insurgents we hear about really were. But first of all, here's a trailer for their film. Now, what was it that uh, inspired you to go to Iraq, or were you in Iraq when you had the idea, or did you have the idea in America or Britain and go there? Steve and I were both in Iraq in the spring of 2003 after the fall of Baghdad, and I think any journalist that was there heard about these sporadic small-scale attacks that were happening against coalition forces at the time. And with our 30-plus combined years of covering conflict, Steve and I sort of looked at each other and said, well, this is interesting. What's going on here? Let's, let's, let's try to find out what's behind this. So that was really the, the impetus for working on the project. And there, was, there was very little in the way of primary source reporting. Most of the information, as, as, and this remains true to this day, most of the information about who the other side are is coming from the US military. And as journalists, we just decided to carry out some standard journalistic practices and go and ask people. And that's one of the most uh, controversial things about the film. But tell, tell me what you, your theory as a result of all that is about who the insurgents were and are they the same people now, Well, th all these years later? It's interesting that as we were shooting the film, um, the National Intelligence Council in the United States uh, produced a national intelligence report in which they said um, the United States is facing an insurgency um, which is nationalist, popular, and has deep roots in the society and will be fighting, will be fighting a counterinsurgency war for decades to come. And interestingly enough, it was the same people that we were finding. They were just ordinary people, and it was this was coming out of the street primarily. 
and were none of the insurgents what we heard we heard they were uh, terrorists from from other countries that there are, there, are, there, are, there are definitely foreigners that have come in to fight, and we have one Syrian, young Syrian guy who'd come into Iraq to fight, but they are not the driving force. I think the implication from the, um, from the message that was put out by the U.S. government and by the military was that the people that oppose the American presence in Iraq are fringe elements of the Iraqi society. That's not really the Iraqis. And what we found is that it's something very different, and what the National Intelligence Estimate said, which is that it is actually regular Iraqis with families and jobs who are opposing the presence of foreign troops in their country. And seeking self-determination basically virtually every car bomb has been set off by a by an, a neighborhood Iraqi I that think, seems extraordinary yeah I think I think one of the uh, w one of the great confusions that has arisen certainly over uh, over the last three years has been to talk about the insurgency as one monolithic uh, entity and what we have in Iraq is two wars. We have the war against occupation and we have a civil war. The civil war, as, as General Jackson was saying earlier, this is, this is about modern day politics playing out. This is about people with differing views of the future of, of, of the society, how it's going to be, whether it's going to, and, and what we see in the civil war is nationalism versus partition. Um, people who want to keep the country together against those who would uh, who divide it in three, and w one of the one of the entities that wants to divide it in three, of course, is the U.S.-backed central government. But the and majority, but the majority of the violence, the U.S. Department of Defense statistics are very interesting. Uh, the reports to Congress that are filed quarterly uh, from April 2004 through the end of last year through December 2007 show that 74 percent of uh, significant attacks in Iraq target the U.S.-led coalition forces. 16 percent target Iraqi army and police which, as the film shows, some of the resistance groups view as legitimate targets for their collaboration. The remaining 10% of attacks target uh, civilians. So the majority of the violence has, was when we were doing the reporting, and, and continues to be anti-occupation violence, uh, a violence, uh, an effort to remove the occupying forces. But, but I mean, General Sir Mike Jackson said, we basically don't know, but you think which was an honest reply, but, uh, but you think that if the troops were all withdrawn forthwith, there would be less violence, not more? You'd remove that 74% for a start. Um, and, and also the amount of violence that the United States pushes back with. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the American military is not trained to pussyfoot around in these circumstances. Um, w one of the things that we're seeing to, you know, right just this week are airstrikes uh, in an urban area. Um, that's significant violence. And I think, I, I actually believe that given the structure of Iraqi society, given, uh, uh, given the history of, uh, of Iraq, I do believe that a withdrawal of US troops would create a set of conditions in which solutions would begin. And that's, uh, I, I think that is the most important part of it. And do you think Iraq will survive as a state? That's what the civil war is really about. It's about whether Iraq will be partitioned up um, or whether it will continue as a strong central government with a strong national uh, identity and, and, frankly, with nationalized resources, with their oil as, as belonging to the public. Well, thank you both very much for, thank you. for being with us. Well, we've got some differing views there on the whole subject of this war. And the verdict, as they used to say on television, the verdict is yours. Good night, they used to always say. Uh, but. Uh, Unlike those uh, Maasai warriors, we'll still be running next week. They will be taking a brief rest. Join us then.